Like so many of you, I watch Yellowstone. And while the story is fictional, it nonetheless addresses weighty issues that Americans are currently confronting. Indigenous land claims, missing and murdered Indigenous women, oppression, power, discrimination, misogyny, and integrity of those in positions of authority. Given that context, a scene in episode two of season two seems to have evaded scrutiny and commentary by the writers. So I offer a few observations on behalf of conscientious educators. The scene is as follows. It's Monica's first day of teaching at the university. As she enters the classroom, a student mistakes her for the teacher's aid. Monica curtly corrects her, glancing up only briefly. Then another student announces, I saw this video on Pornhub and this is exactly how it starts. Several students chuckle. Making eye contact for the first time, Monica responds, misogyny, how refreshing. If you work in a Pocahontas joke, you'll hit the trifecta, referring to her own indigenous heritage. The student who is white and male continues, well, now that you mention it, what's your name? Monica demands. Trent, he answers. Can you tell me the definition of power, Trent? It's the ability to direct or influence another's behavior or course of events. That's what I have. I can remove you from this class and fail you, or I can send you before the Dean for violating the student code of conduct. The thing is, I can alter the course of your life. That's power. You don't have any. Trent is silent and obviously embarrassed. Monica begins the lesson by reading a quote from Columbus's journal in which he recounted how compliant the natives were and what good slaves they would make. She again turns to Trent and asks, you ever feel like that, Trent? You ever feel like making someone do what you want, whether they want to or not? Trent remains silent. Although she has not introduced herself, Monica goes on to introduce the course by framing it around the European mentality of power and oppression over others and implying a comparison to her exchange with Trent. After class, Trent runs to catch up with Monica and apologize for his comments and behavior. Monica interrupts him and threatens him before accepting the apology with a curt apology accepted. Meanwhile, Monica's academic administrator silently joined the class as she began reading the journal. He didn't hear the first exchange with Trent, only Monica's follow-up comments, Trent's apology, and her reply to it. In their debriefing after class, the administrator tells Monica that she did well on her first day. He didn't ask for an explanation regarding Trent, but comments on the apology after Trent had left, saying, day one and you're already winning hearts and minds. To which Monica responds, that mind is far from one. So here are my observations. I view all things education related through a moral and ethical lens. This segment is no different. From that perspective, it represents teaching that is bad and wrong. Three reasons why. The first, the exchanges between Monica and Trent are examples of public shaming and teacher bullying. It is bad and wrong to embarrass or humiliate a student intentionally and knowingly. And Monica does it twice, three times if you count the apology exchange that the administrator witnessed. We don't often know the struggles our students face, how personally, socially, or academically vulnerable they are, and just how harmful shaming and bullying might be to their dignity, confidence, social status, and learning. Public shaming and bullying also undermine a collaborative and collegial learning environment by deterring other students from speaking up for fear of similar treatment. Obviously, Trent was baiting Monica and his behavior and comments were reprehensible, but Monica chose to publicly take the bait to take it personally and to use Trent to center herself as the authoritarian presence in the classroom. Secondly, Monica missed opportunities to teach, to learn, to discuss, to understand, and to relate, all of which are core aims of education and schooling. The point Monica hoped to convey, namely the link between the attitude of European supremacy then and now, 
was likely lost on Trent, who was busy managing his humiliation. And for the other students, it was convoluted by her use of the term misogyny in the present, but not the historical context, without any explanation or expansion. It is difficult, maybe impossible, to understand students' worldviews, beliefs, attitudes, to shape those toward the values of the community and society in which they live, and to monitor what and if they are learning and internalizing when such spontaneous opportunities for discussion and sharing are so definitively shut down, not only for Trent, but for the entire class. And finally, in addition to her overly aggressive manner in the classroom, Monica was unkind, ungracious, unfair, and disrespectful when Trent apologized, especially as his apology was unsolicited and seemed honest and sincere. Teaching is widely accepted as a moral endeavor. That means, in part, that teachers are held to a high moral and ethical standard and expected to be models of good and right conduct and behavior at all levels of education. They set the tone for a range of interactions in and outside the classroom. Given the nature of Trent's apology, Monica's response, and her mean-spirited, holier-than-thou comment to the administrator, Trent assumed the higher moral ground, and this should not have been the case in this circumstance. So what could Monica have done? While the specific methods will differ, situations like this call for both an immediate response and a follow-up response. Because the situation is public, the immediate response will also be public. It should focus on two goals. The first is to set behavior limits for Trent and by extension, the other students. Monica might have assumed a scaling up approach from ignoring Trent to giving him a stern, I see you and I know what you are doing look, to warning him gently and then more firmly and to asking him to take a break from the classroom if the behavior continued. Teachers at all levels have several strategies for dealing with disruptive students that minimize the potential for harm to the student and the class. The second goal related to the content of Trent's statements is to teach or facilitate learning. Monica might have repositioned Trent's comments toward the topic of study without so directly shaming him for them. She might have invited discussion by asking the class, for example, do Columbus's sentiments toward indigenous people persist today? Where might we experience them? What do you think people assume about me? This would provide an opportunity to unpack and explore individual and collective attitudes, assumptions, and beliefs, and set the precedent for a collaborative, collegial, and learning-oriented classroom environment. The follow-up response involves a private discussion between Trent and Monica, in which a more fulsome dialogue around issues of kindness, acceptance, and respect for others the individual and collective harm caused by comments such as his, and the roots of his beliefs, conduct, and behavior in class. This is discipline through teaching, sometimes referred to as developmental discipline or positive discipline. These discussions can lead to a caring, respectful, and trusting relationship between a teacher and student, something that has been prized and prioritized for decades. The success of these discussions, the class-wide and private, depends on Monica's ability to find her own moral compass as a good, ethical person and educator. The irony is that while Monica preaches about the evils of oppression in a historical societal context, she exhibits oppressive conduct and behavior in the classroom. Such hypocrisy is rarely lost on students and rarely forgiven. So, Maybe I'm taking this all too seriously. After all, it is television high drama, and the scene with its sharp combative dialogue made for a crackling three minutes of content. But in my defense, we are supposed to think of Monica as a protagonist, at least to this point in the story. Yet she flaunts and abuses her position of power in the classroom, and there is no corrective in the narrative to hint at this being morally or ethically wrong. Simply put, this is bad teaching, and we are meant to think of it as good or at least acceptable. 
Such portrayals in widely watched and referenced shows influence our moral and ethical perceptions and what we ought to strive for, and they inform our acceptance or rejection of models and standards of practice. They matter. Perhaps there will be a reckoning as the story evolves. But in the meantime, I thought it was worth noting.